Hello, friends. I come to you from my office here in Flowery Branch, Georgia, this week for our weekly message. We do have some sermons ready to air for you from various stops, but as I was in the Word this week, and as I prepared our Tuesday midweek Bible study lesson for our group here in Georgia, I was really struck by the need to post a special sermon this week. Um, I even kind of fought that urge because I cover the material, some of the material that I want to talk about today, I cover in the first 12 to 15 minutes of our last study in the lessons lessons in, in John, which was this past week, I did studies number 19, Jesus Lifted Up. If you have not watched or listened to that one, I would recommend it. You don't have to have seen it to understand what we're going to do today. However, if you have seen or heard it, you're going to hear some familiar scriptures today. But I get to elaborate today um, and go a little deeper into some of these areas. And I do this, as you noticed, our title is The Exploitation of God's Children. This is a topic that, I guess due to the fact that I'm a, a church lifer, I've been in this my entire life and I... Um, I don't really know anything else other than spending time in church and in ministry. And I mean, I've done other things, but th- this has been the bulk of who I am, raised in, in it a- as a pastor's kid and, and then in ministry and full-time ministry. And um, that's why I have such an affinity for the church and for the, for the things that happen in the church. And particularly, I have a real concern for the things happening from the church to God's people. Um, it's one thing when the non-believers have an impression of the church, and I think we should work on fixing that where we can. We should work on living in a way that would... would I, I, I kind of feel like we should work on living in a way if someone were on the fence, say, I don't know if I believe in God, but maybe if I saw him in action, that would make a difference. Maybe we should live as if someone, we're going to encounter someone today who's on the fence. That might cause us to, to live in a way, and I don't, I'm not talking about performance for your righteousness, but it might cause us to live out our righteousness in a way that is conducive to someone's relationship. Um, but I'm not even really talking about how the unbeliever views the church as much as how the believer is ex- is experiencing the body of Christ. I'm a big fan of the body. I, I I believe that the church is an extension and an arm of the kingdom. It is not the entire kingdom, but it is an extension of the kingdom. And I think that we should uh, understand that the role that the church plays is soul care. It's to really nourish one another. That's why church is so important for community, because we grow intellectually and mentally and emotionally within community. And it, it's important that we have community and that we not live as an island entire of ourselves, uh, away from everything that causes a disconnect in us that is unhealthy in many ways, even physically. The church provides that community, that basis of relationship, and that might be the church's greatest contribution. I think Paul mentions that when he talks about each member having their specific role. Why? And then he compares it to a literal body, a hand and a foot. You don't use your hand for everything. You need your feet for some things and vice versa. And so there's that beautiful dynamic of why we all exist and why that is important. But I take very seriously how we handle the soul care aspect of church leadership from those who are in charge, that might not be the right way to say that, but at least those who are in the structure at sort of a leadership role, how are they treating those whom they lead? How are they handling them? Are they leading them with care? Are they leading them with comfort? Are they leading them in love? What, what, is, what are they trying to do? You know, when Hebrews talks about this in, in Hebrews 13, and we deal, dealt with this a lot in our Hebrews study. It, it, the, the author of Hebrews said that he wrote so that their hearts would be established in grace, but he writes that in the midst of a leadership passage. So for me, the big purpose of leadership is to care for people's souls um, 
as Hebrews 13, 17 says, and I'll put that on your screen. Observe those who lead you. The old King James, New King James says, who rule over you, but it's a poor translation out of the Greek. Obey those who lead you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. The, the object of soul care is not for the leadership to replace the great shepherd. We are simply, and I say we because I'm in that role, we are simply connecting sheep to the great shepherd. We're helping make a connection. And I think leaders are leaders serve, otherwise leadership is worthless. So if, if there's a leadership that, that is not in the servanthood business, as far as I'm concerned, that's worthless leadership. Why do you need a leader if they're not going to serve? Jesus showed his disciples how to lead. You know, in, in, in our kingdom, he says, it's going to be that we serve those uh, ahead of us. And so the topic of, of God's children being exploited almost infuriates me, honestly. It, it, it disturbs me in the same way, in many ways, that it disturbs me to hear about you know, a, a sex trafficker or child exploitation, someone who's abusing the innocent, who's taking advantage of their ignorance or their inability to fight back or takes advantage of their trust or their naivete, and they make someone believe something they shouldn't believe or they force themselves upon someone in a way that is um, malevolent. I, 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 that infuriates anyone. But for me, it kind of does the same thing inside of me when I see it happening in the church because I realize that people are using their authority in a way to exploit and to harm instead of a way to help. Uh, the Apostle Paul dealt with that attitude when he when he wrote uh, to the Corinthian church that he realized that he could use his, um, his authority one of two ways. Look at 2 Corinthians 13.10. I write these things being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. It tells me that our sharpness and our authority can edify people or they can destroy people, and spiritually mature leaders know the difference. But it doesn't mean that that's always the way we're being handled. It, it, sometimes when uh, our sharpness should be edifying people, it's destroying people. I'm using this text to try and show, and I'm going to lead in in a moment to another one from Peter, but to try to show that Paul understood that he had a great amount of authority that when he opened his mouth, things could happen. That's a very heady responsibility, and you better take it serious. When you open your mouth and you speak into people's lives, you have the power and potential to change them, and that change can be for the good or that change can be for the bad. And it's important to take responsibility as a leader that you should speak life in, into people and you should speak things that edify and edify means to build up. And you might argue and counter and say, well, we're supposed to be telling the truth and sometimes the truth hurts and it can be painful. And yes, there are moments where we must be very, we must be very sharp in a way that puts someone in a course correction, but we don't have to destroy the vessel in order to correct its course. We need not bash holes into the side of it, and we certainly don't need for it to owe us, and that to me is the danger. Um, I wanted to do this lesson on this week for this reason. It's the top of the year in regards to the date on the calendar. Some of you won't hear this for months and maybe years later, but for those that are following and tracking with us weekly, this one happens on the first Sunday of the year. I had another sermon ready to go. That sermon will push back another week. Uh, it was one of our messages from the road from the end of last year. Um, but I, I really wanted to put this one here because I know that this is the time of the year when God's children are exploited at an even greater rate than at any other time of the year. What I mean by that is we're at the top of the year where New Year's resolutions are happening. People are making decisions about how they're going to move forward and in the new year and they're making promises and they're making commitments and um, the church is going to jump in on this all across America today on on 
I'm recording this, but it's going to air on our platforms on a Sunday. So I'm saying today as if it's Sunday. Um, all across America, there's going to be drives and push for how you're going to treat your new year. I don't think in and of itself that's a bad thing. I don't think the Bible is against you having resolve or making a decision to improve yourself or to be better or not to make some of the same decisions you've made in the past. I think that would be behoove all of us to probably take some of that more serious. The problem is, is that some of the tactics that are going to be used are the tactics very similar to those in the world and in some cases even beyond what the world would try to pull. Um, there's going to be a lot of challenges and a lot of promises made. And it's this time of year that we're very ripe for exploitation as children of God. And one of the reasons that we're ripe for a couple of the ways that, we, that we're going to see this manifest, and I'm, I'm not a stone thrower, I'm not going to call any names or, or ministries, um, I don't need to. You either are impacted by these things or you're not. And if you are, you'll know. And if you're not, maybe it'll open your heart up to those who are. And you can have compassion and mercy and maybe pluck some of those out of the fire, as it were. Um, one of the things that's going to be used is uh, guilt. Guilt over your past. You're going to be prompted to look back on the past year. Where did you fail? Where did you fail to do better? Where did you break promises you made? Where did you let God down? Where did you miss opportunities? Where did God open doors and you refuse to go through them? And so guilt is going to be the starting block, guilt and condemnation, of which we know Christ has paid for us and there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And maybe looking, yes, looking back and dealing with our Saul is a good way to influence our Paul. Absolutely remember what he was. But we also at the same time aren't to live in guilt and shame over our past. Christ has borne our reproach at the cross so that we can be free. The second thing that will be done is not only will guilt be used and, and manufactured, but there will also be a certain level of fear that's placed in front. Even fear is the greatest motivator of all. Fear gets people to empty their hearts and their wallets, and that's a big motivator. Um, fear over your future, fear over the, the world at large, fear politically, fear financially, fear of your marriage or your children or your destiny. Um, scared for your future will be a great motivator in exploiting the people. Um, before I get into some of the tricks, because they're tricks, I want to show you the trickster. Uh, when we think of the trickster, we think of the devil. And in John 10, Jesus said, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. And we go, well, that's Satan. And I don't think it is. I mean, it's a form of Satan, but it's not some cosmic figure called the devil. Jesus said, everyone who came before me are thieves and liars. They're robbers, uh, thieves and robbers. And then he describes what the thief is, is the thief is a man who prompts you to go in through any other way but the door. And in other words, they prompt you to get a result outside of the door. Who's the door? Jesus. So they prompt you to get a result through some other means than trusting in the finished work of Christ. And so I think there's a lot of stealing, killing, and destroying going to start today in churches across our country. And I don't paint every church with the same brush, of course. And I don't paint every ministry with the same brush. I wouldn't be fair. I wouldn't want anybody to do that to me. I wouldn't do it to anyone else. But there's definitely going to be some stealing, killing, and destroying get started today through exploitation. Here's what it's going to look like. Second Peter, and we just dealt with both of Peter's epistles on the podcast over the last few months, but Second Peter chapter 2, and Peter starts talking about false teachers with destructive heresies. Look at verse 3. By covetousness or by lust, they will exploit you with deceptive words. Um, the ESV says they'll exploit you with false words. For a long time their judgment's not been idle. Their destruction does not slumber or will not slumber. Look at the top of that verse again. By covetousness or out of greed... By greed, rather, yes, that's the ESV version, they will exploit you with deceptive or false words. 
Greed is a motivator of exploitation. It's going to happen right and left. The Greek word, I'm going to put this up for you. The Greek word for exploit is emporomai. It doesn't appear a lot in the New Testament, but when it does, it is a peddler. It is someone who is in merchandising. It is someone who is buying and selling. So for Peter to say that by greed, they're going to exploit you with false words, what Peter is saying is, is that greedy people are going to enter in and buy and sell you with falsehoods. They're going to buy your loyalty. They're going to sell your loyalty. They're going to buy your soul and sell your soul. There's an element of money involved in this deception that is undeniable, but it, it's not a, it's on, the only thing that Peter is referencing here, though you can't get around that in the Greek, that this is a peddler. This is someone who's peddling something selling you a bill of goods and buying you in some form of slavery. Let me give you some of the tricks that are going to be used. Um, I would like to say I never used any of these tricks. That would be wrong. I did use a few of them. Um, I'm not happy about that. I'm not proud of that. I've tried to purge the digital record of anything along those lines. Um, And the fact that I was ever involved in it at all has been a big scar in my soul and one that I've had to be healed of, and it has caused me problems to this day. Many of my own viewers and listeners know my own um, very reluctant spirit behind ever asking for help, money, because I've been so burned in my own experience by ministries that now I look at it as exploitation. And so I I realize that not every time you say, hey, we need help, here's why. I, I realize that's not exploitation, but there's so many fear tactics involved that I'm, I'm so reluctant uh, to ever be involved. Um, here, here's some of the tricks. You're going to have fear of the apocalypse. There's a lot of end, end time talk, last days talk. It's going to be thrown in front of you. And uh, that has become a multi-million dollar industry. There's whole ministries that are, that are raking in millions of dollars a year, preparing people for the apocalypse, preparing people for the end times. Um, I don't, I don't actually have one thing to say one way or the other about people who prepare for disaster. I do have something to say about supposed men and women of God who spiritually intimidate people into preparing for disaster and it, and they cause you to pay for the privilege of that fear. To me, that is, that is rank Uh, exploitation by greedy people who are cashing in on your own fear. Most of the time, they spend very little time actually talking about the Bible. They spend very little time actually contextually talking about the Bible. And yet they'll bring in more in five minutes of fear than some will bring in in a whole year of trying to remove grave clothes off of people. That's not a... I, I feel myself as one who tries to bring grave clothes off of people, so I'm not saying it in any form of jealousy. I set back incredulous that people respond with such fervor over fear. It's why I've dedicated myself the last few years to trying to ease your pain in regards to eschatology. I've had to take a lot of shots doing that because that doesn't make people very, they not make me very popular. Um, a lot of people in the grace community actually turned me off when I started to show that I think that the New Testament writers were talking about something different when they said the end of the age and that they were talking about a system that needed judged and removed so that we could enter the fullness of the kingdom. That got me turned... I, got, I lost grace people. I lost supporters and I lost people. Um, and I still hear occasionally from some of them like, hey, I like your grace stuff, but you're out here. I'm disappointed in you. And I'm saying I'm trying to release you from fear and I'm trying to release you from the intimidation. And I'm trying to do it contextually. So I'm actually spending time in the word on these things and then putting those scriptures out there and putting those resources out there. And yet there's a whole wing of the body of Christ exploiting that fear in people and getting paid for it. And that to me is is amazing. Um, 
Another trick that's going to be used is the threat of financial ruin. Some of you are going to be told that if you don't give to a certain level, you're going to be cursed with the financial curse. God's actually actively going to work against you. And you might lose your job. You won't get the promotion you, you think you deserve. You'll have bills that just pop up out of nowhere for stuff you forgot you even owed. You'll have no provision to pay it because you're robbing God of your tithe or you're not giving towards the ministries that are doing the greatest amount of good or you're giving to things that um, are, are not whatever ministry approved. I've, I've been involved in that too. Um, and, and so they'll use a scripture here or there, a smattering of scripture. Most of it's going to be pulled from the old covenant uh, you as a Gentile under the new covenant are going to, they're going to attempt to intimidate you into giving old covenant style while they won't ask you to come forward and slay a, kill a lamb on the altar of the church to cover your sin. They will ask you to do what the Jews had to do in giving of your first fruits and that you would have to do it or you would be cursed. But when it comes to your salvation, they'll tell you, no, you don't need lambs, you've got Jesus. It'll be interesting how Jesus will work for you when it comes to your sin, but he doesn't work for you when it comes to money. And that is a, that's a scare tactic designed to, uh, to destroy and intimidate. Um, another trick will be extra biblical revelation. Ministries will say the Lord... This isn't necessarily stated this way in the Bible, but the Lord has shown me. And then they'll go into what it is the Lord has shown, supposedly shown them. And uh, that extra biblical revelation will have, uh, it'll have just enough spiritual sounding parts to it that, that people will buy it because they're being exploited out of biblical ignorance and because they don't study the Bible contextually and because the wrong hermeneutic is emphasized. They'll, they'll be exploited. What I mean by the wrong hermeneutic is, like, I love the idea of correlating numbers, okay? You know, what an old t something happens in the Old Testament under a certain number, and then it happens in the New Testament. One I just use, I use coming up on the podcast is 40 days. Jesus goes 40 days into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Why 40 days? Well, the children of Israel spied out the promised land 40 days and then they didn't take it. And that correlates them into walking around the same mountain for 40 years. So Jesus needs to go into their wilderness and redeem it. And, but he can't, he don't have time to go in 40 years. So instead he goes into the wilderness 40 days, which is the same amount of time they were scouting out the promised land. So you have Jesus redeeming them of, Jesus is our promised land, redeeming us from our failure to take the promised land through our performance, which we can't do. That's a great correlation. It stays true to the Old Testament and the New Testament. It, it doesn't move outside of the Bible. But I don't overemphasize numerology. You, know, you get into this stuff where you go, well, this says this number, and so that number equals this, which add it to this number equals this. And what you end up with is the opportunity to exploit people. So what's going to happen, and probably is already happening, um, and maybe you've heard it, is someone's going to quote a chapter and a verse, and they're going to then say, well, you need to uh, give according to this, and you can have this. Let me give you an example. I mean, I'm just going to we'll just pick my Bible up right now. Let's just jump back. Isaiah is always a really popular one. You just open it up. Um, I just literally the first verse I saw, Isaiah 52, 7. I'm not even going to put it on the screen. I'll just read it to you, okay? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And they'll say, okay, well, the Holy Spirit has shown me that if you want to be this guy who brings the glad tidings of good things and have your feet declared to be beautiful, then you need to give Isaiah 52, 7 a look and then you need to give $52.70. And that if you give $52.70, or any iteration of it, you can, give, you can give a monthly gift of $5.27, you can give a one-time gift of $52.70, or you can give $527, or for the very wealthy of you out there, and you know who you are, you can give $5,270. And you can have your feet be declared peace and beautiful upon the mountains. And the Holy Spirit has told me to tell you that if you'll do that right now, that's what he's going to give you in this new year. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exploitation of God's children at its finest. 
it ignores the finished work of Christ. It adds numerology to the word. It goes on top of the scriptures as if there is some private interpretation, which Peter told us there's not a private interpretation. It's exploiting people who don't know the hermeneutic, who don't know to study, and who just trust the voice that's been placed in front of them. My wife and I, several years ago, were in Kenya, and we were ministering and driving down the road with the host pastor, and a famous American evangelist was on the radio. I won't say who this person was, but they did that very thing I just did. They took a chapter and a verse, and they said, the Lord is telling me to tell you that if you will give, and it was, I don't know, 60-something dollars and so much cents per month, then this favor and prosperity would be yours. And I said to the host pastor, I said, how much does the average Kenyan make a year? And he told me, and it was about that amount of money that you were supposed to give every month. And I said, so they're basically asking you to give your entire yearly salary every month to receive the favor of God. Don't they realize a message that doesn't work in a third world country shouldn't be a message that works in a first world country? The gospel knows no race, creed, color, or sex. The gospel is universal for all. And the pastor honestly didn't get it, didn't see the problem. They, they thought, well, you know, if you could give that much, that'd be great because how much more favor would come your way? My heart broke at the exploitation of God's children. This kind of foolishness is happening all the time. You're probably going to see some of it. You're, you're probably going to see it in regards to things like church attendance or Bible study or fasting. Um, you know, top of the year fast kind of stuff. Like you've got to do this so God will do this. The more you do of this, the more God will give back to you. I had someone visiting me this last week who had went to a church and they said that the church was prompting a top of the year fast so that you could receive the favor of God in the new year. And they went through the congregation and said, how many of you have done this in the past? And everybody, of course, raised their hand. And they said, how many of you have fasted three days and stand up, and a bunch of people stood. Now remain standing if you've made it seven days, and a bunch of people remain standing. Remain, stand up if you've made it 10. And they made it all the way to 40. And they said, so this was a big place. They said, how many of you have made it 40 days? And one, one or two women, men stood up. I think it was, they said it was just a couple people, stood up in the congregation. And everybody cheered, and the, the person leading, I don't know if it's the pastor or leading the service, said, the, these are the superstars of Christianity. And the person that was telling me this story was incredulous. Like, I, yeah, I couldn't believe it. You, apparently, you know, 39 days of fasting, you're not a superstar. 40, you are. Uh, I'm incredulous hearing the story because to me, uh, well, first of all, to be the superstar of Christianity doesn't make a lot of sense when you didn't do anything to become a Christian but believe anyhow. And I don't know how you go from believing to receive your favor to working to receive your favor and consider that a step up. That seems to me like that would be a step back. <laughs> Listen, what is happening is we're, we're exchanging one yoke of slavery, sin, for another yoke of slavery, performance. And because of that slave mentality and that action, we're, we're struggling. Look at Paul, Romans 6.16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether it's sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Look at the middle part of that. Whoever you present yourselves slaves to obey, that's whose slaves you are to obey. Or as Peter says it, 2 Peter 2.19, while they promise them liberty... They themselves are slaves of corruption, for by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. And I think what is happening is we've presented ourselves as slaves and maybe in many cases innocently been exploited by people who should be caring for our soul but are exploiting our soul for money. And by the way, I think that this next step is inevitable Whenever you start dealing with people who have sort of extra biblical revelation or they're using the underpinnings, they're taking scriptures out of context, they don't ever talk context, they don't ever talk covenant, they just pull verses from here, 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 and then try to prop up some sort of revelation. I'm telling you, 
the next step in extra biblical revelation is the ability for you to buy your way out of whatever they've just been revealed to. So the next, mark my words, the next step is, look, for all of those of you that want to participate in this, whatever it is, say it's a fast, you're going to receive God's favor and it's going to be proportional to the effort that you put in and it's going to be proportional to the ability that you show. But for those of you that just can't do it, maybe for health reasons or you just can't do it because of some things going on in your life, the Lord has said to me, if you'll give X amount you will receive the same amount of favor you would have received if you had done that. That's the next step. You go, oh, no, they'll never go that far. Mm, just wait for it. If you're going to go extra biblical on one, you can go extra biblical on the next. I mean, the Catholic Church for years sold indulgences and built cathedrals all over Europe and sold it on the backs of people who were trying to take care of their relatives out of purgatory. Those dollars and cents add up pretty fast. So the moment that you want to start adding revelation... You can start adding more of it, and you can make big, big profit off of it. Now, I don't, listen, I don't have a problem at all with, 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 with big money or people making money. or people. Let's don't exploit people to do it. Let's don't rob them. Let's don't make them guilt-ridden, and let's don't cover them in fear. We should be better than this. Why are we not better than this? I, we are better. We are better. I, I'm optimistic. I don't think that this is every single believer falling into these traps. And I certainly don't think it's every ministry, but we're at that right time of the year for it. And so let's not be exploited. So what I want to do in the next few minutes, and this we did in the first 10 or 15 minutes of that Tuesday meeting this last week, um, is I want to give you five principles as you head into this year. These are not like do this and your life will be better. These are identification principles, things that you need to know about you, things that the Bible, New Covenant, says about you. And if you get them and you know them, then you can rest and you won't be ripe for exploitation. And that's my goal, is to keep you from being ripe for exploitation. And so I want to put them up one at a time, one statement with a verse, and then there's going to be a lot of areas you can run into each one of these. And if you'll get these five things and you'll establish them in your heart, then I think that you will be immune in many cases to the exploitation. Number one, please know this. You are already accepted. You don't need to do anything to be accepted. You don't need to earn acceptance. You don't need to worry about losing acceptance. Ephesians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the church at Ephesus, writes a lot of great things, and there's that massive in him passage that runs from the top of the chapter through uh, well down into the 12th, 13th verses of all the different things that we have in Christ. Look at 4, 5, and 6. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace by which He made us accepted In the beloved. That phrase accepted is the Greek word karitu, which appears twice in the New Testament, once here, and once when the angel says to Mary, You are highly favored among women. Now, what I like to ask is, What did Mary do to be declared highly favored? I think the correct answer is nothing. She was just highly favored. Paul uses the same word. Its its root is karis, grace. You are highly favored in the beloved. Who's the beloved? Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. As he comes out of the water, the dove spirit comes down like a dove and rests upon him. And a voice from heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Christ is the beloved one of God. You are accepted in Christ. You have received everything the father thinks about the son. Past tense, have received. You are accepted in the beloved. You don't have to do anything to be more accepted. Number two, we, you, I'm going to personalize these. You have been given everything that you need. Jesus said that if a man eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he has my life in him. And any man who eats of my flesh or drinks of this water shall never 
hunger again and shall never thirst again because Jesus is trying to show that spiritually hunger and thirst are taken care of in Christ. You've been given everything that you need. Here's how Peter says that. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. What you need to know is more of what you need to know. Grace and peace is multiplied through knowledge, not through action. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Look at that. You've been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Not part of them, not some of them, all of them. Four, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. God has already given you precious promises. They are the answer to escaping. You are not the answer to escaping. Your effort is not the answer to escaping. You've already escaped. You've already escaped the corruption of the world, and you're being exploited if someone tells you you need to do this, 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 and this, pay this, do this, stop doing that, then you won't, be, you won't uh, have the corruption of the world. Peter says you've already escaped the corruption of the world. You've already been given exceedingly great and precious promises. You don't have to earn them. God doesn't have to re-promise them to you. There is no dollar amount attached to them. There's no activity attached to them. They are already yours. You've already been given everything that you need. Number three, everything that you need is found in Christ. You haven't been given everything that you need because you've done it all. Because if that's the case, then if you haven't done it all, you don't have everything you need. And that's the source of the exploitation. This idea that you are deficient. That's what the snake used on Eve in the garden. God didn't give you everything you need. You need to eat that. And we've been falling for that lie forever. And, and it's witchcraft for the, for the pulpit to do that to the pew. There's more you need and here's what you got to do to get it. No, you have all you need in Christ. And it's found in Christ. Here's why. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 20 to 22. All of the promises of God, for all the promises of God in Him are yes and in Him amen to the glory of God through us. Just stare at 20 for a moment. Listen to that again. All of God's promises. All that stuff in the Old Testament, you've probably... Heard someone get up and read all the promises of God out of the Old Testament. Here's what you get. Here's what you get. Here's what you get. Here's what you got to do to get it. Okay, I'll tell you what you got to do to get it. You got to believe Jesus gave it to you and say amen to it. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. Look at that. Even the anointing you didn't pay for. You can't earn. You don't have the ability to keep it or improve it. It's yours because he gave it to you. And he, 22, sealed you and gave you the spirit as a guarantee. That word guarantee means down payment. Listen, God put the Holy Spirit in you as a down payment. I like to say this. You, you're not putting down payments on heaven. Heaven put a down payment on you. God, you're his purchased possession. He hadn't fully taken you in yet. He will. The guarantee that he will is he gave you the Holy Spirit. That's his down payment. Why in the world are we being exploited into believing we've got to put a down payment in heaven? Heaven has put a down payment in us. You're not putting down payments down hoping you get home, showing God how serious you are, and starting off the new year by making it your best January ever so that the favor of God follows you the other 11 months. You know the worst thing that could happen to you is for you to do a bunch of fleshly stuff in January for the Lord, and then you see blessings later in the year, and you go, there it was. That's, that's what did it. And the reality is the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. I mean, there's going to be blessings and they're not going to come because you earn them. And there could be two people in the same room. One guy's working for it and the other guy's not. And then the blessing falls. The guy that didn't work for it's going to go, see, I didn't have to work for it. The guy that worked said, see, I had to work for it. Why, when are we going to realize that God is good because it's in his heart to be good? He's not good because you bought him out. Besides, he, you didn't buy him out. He's bought you. You're the purchased possession. You're the one who has the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Number four, we can't start in faith 
and then switch over to works. In other words, we don't come in by believing for salvation and then start receiving all the good stuff because we perform for it. Listen to Paul, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? To bewitch is to cast an evil eye. Uh, there's also a snake charmer um, illusory image there in the Greek. Who charmed you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? That's a great question. Did, did the Holy Spirit come into you because you did the right thing or because of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made, being made perfect by the flesh? Are we so dumb, are we so stupid as to think that we were perfected by our faith in Christ and His grace did the work, but if we want to do better and, and receive more, which is crazy, how can you do better than perfect? But if you want to walk into that greater place, so, so-called, you're going to have to do that through your performance. This is the, the whole meet God halfway business. You do your part, God does His part. No, you can't start in faith and switch to works, which leads me to number five. You need to make a decision. It's either grace or it's performance. It's either one or it's the other. It's not both. It can't be both. You can't switch back and forth. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. If it's by grace, then it's no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it's works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. In other words, it's one way or the other. It's either the grace of God or it's your performance. It can't be God's grace plus your performance. It can't be God does his part, you do your part. Am I saying that we have nothing to do? Well, no, of course I'm not saying we have nothing to do. We just don't have anything to do to be more righteous, and we don't have anything to do to have more favor. What do we need to do? Well, we need to spread the kingdom on the earth by showing the love of God to our neighbor. That's a good place to start. How about we love people? That's something you get to do. You want to do something? Go be kind. Be gentle. You want to do something? Walk in wisdom. Redeem the time. You want to do something? Don't give place to the foolishness of the enemy. That's some th- stuff you can do. You're already God's righteous. Why don't you go do righteousness? Don't go do righteousness to be righteous. That defeats the purpose. You're already righteous. Go be who he has called and destined you to be. What's the end game for the exploitation of God's children? Well, here's what I know. I know that God's in charge of taking care of his church. I'm not in charge of taking care of his church. He is. I know that in the New Testament, he only allowed the exploitation of his church to an extent. Whether it was Ananias and Sapphira, or it's, as Paul says to the Corinthians, that you know, God's going to take care of those who destroy his temple. I don't know how he does it, and I don't know in what manner. And I won't limit him, and I won't try to predict it or prophesy it. But I do know that he knows how to take care of his, his, his sheep. And so I believe that while there is exploitation rampant among God's people, I do believe that God is sparing his children. I believe that God, um, and in what way I don't know, and won't, again, won't try to say, but I do believe that God takes care of it. In the meantime, and as we go, you and I should always be on guard because Peter had his people on guard, so there must be some utility in you and I being on guard. We must be on guard for those who would exploit the children of God. And let's not be a part of it. Let's not be a part of the exploitation. First of all, let's don't be a part of being exploited. I think the more you understand some of those five foundational truths, and there are others, but those are foundational, the more that your heart will be established in grace and the less likely you are to be exploited by deception and falsehoods and greed, which is a great motivator. Um, And then subsequently, let's not be part of the exploitation process. Let's not be exploiting God's people for greed. Let's not be going after them for what they can get us. I have had people who held me at a close distance, and I had the Lord show me before 
this one's keeping you close in case you get famous. And uh, so be very careful. And I would be sort of peripheral. And then when my name would start popping up in places, you know, people, ooh, have you seen this video by Paul White? I'd hear it from this person. Or there'd be just enough contact that in case I took off, you know, kind of in the stratosphere or the whole go viral thing, that they could, you know, jump in and say, well, I know this guy. And, and so I'm very careful because to me there's a, there's a little bit of spirit of greed and exploitation behind that. And uh, I'm also very careful. This is the time of year we're going to send out our tax receipts. People who've given anything to the ministry will be getting a receipt from us and a New Year's card from our family. And I, I pray over and bless each one of those before we mail them out. I just pray God's blessing on that person's life. And every year I hear the voice of the Spirit of how important it is to take serious and take precious those small gifts as well as the large one. We have some donors that are, that are big, big donors. Uh, well, big for, to me. Um, and then we have some that give just a little bit. And we have some that give a little bitty bit once a year or something. Um, and I've just learned to, to pray the same prayer over them, whatever the amount. And part of that, again, is just that, in a, that, that disdain for the exploitation of God's sheep. Um, and so I don't want to be a part of the exploitation process. I don't want to be a part of the greed process. So it's whenever like, we introduce some things, and we're going to introduce some things this year that are new for us and they're new ways of doing things for us. Um, know that a lot of prayer and thought have went into them and, and hopefully moving along in a way in which God's children are never exploited but are always uplifted. I want to stop today by praying for you. This is a new year, and even if you're listening to this later in the year, I think the information has been valuable enough at whatever state and place we might catch you in life. And I want to just pray the favor of God, show you the areas this year uh, in which he wants to move and wants to do things, but that you be released from the exploitive greed and guilt and shame. Father, I thank you for every viewer and every listener that you've blessed me with. I take their presence very serious. They are precious in your sight. Thus they are in mine. I thank you for those who give and help support the work. I thank you for those who don't give and don't help support the work. They're both precious in your sight. For those who give, I pray that the return they are receiving and hearing this go out is worthwhile and they feel as if they're being part of something important. For those that haven't given, maybe they simply can't. And I thank you for them. And if they haven't given because they don't believe in that sort of thing, then, Father, I respect their position. And I pray that you give us words to continue to say either way. Because, Father, I don't want to be a part of the exploitation and the greed. I don't think anybody watching or listening wants to be either. And so I pray that, Father, we very sensitively follow you. Because it's all about your foundational truth that we're loved. We're your children that we've received precious promises that we don't have to add to them, that we can't do this by works. We can't switch over to works. We've, we've come in by grace. We stay in by grace. Father, I pray favor in the lives of all those listening and watching in 2019. I pray that you will be with them and show them revelation in their life. That they can walk into the, the areas of your word and of, of knowing you that they've never experienced before and that they'll realize that all of those things are accessible to them, not because they've paid for it or earned it, but because you love them. I pray that they start to realize that. The more they realize that, the more they begin to walk into that. I pray favor into their lives. I thank you for them. I believe in God for good things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.